Five years ago, I wouldn't have been able to tell you what a heat pump is. <laughs> so it's pretty dramatic that now that's all I think about all day long. Welcome to Climate Papa. This is a show about climate change, technology, and parenthood. <laughs> Well, welcome to Climate Papa, a show about the intersection of climate change, technology, and parenthood. And I'm Ben Idelson. I'm based in Seattle, and I invest in product-led climate companies. And I'm a papa to two kids, a five-year-old girl and a two-year-old boy. Today's conversation is with Bill Key, a co-founder of a new heat pump company called Quilt. Heat pumps are these almost magical devices that move thermal energy from one place to another. And they are clearly the best way for most of us to heat and cool our homes, offices, and any other space. In this conversation, we unpack why they work so well and also talk about some of the product gaps that could make them even better, which Bill and his team at Quilt are working to address. It turns out how we heat and cool our homes is one of the top climate choices we make alongside our daily transportation. As we release this episode, we are seeing heat waves around the world with one about to hit the Pacific Northwest this week. This heat isn't a minor inconvenience. In many cases, the heat is killing people. Over 1,000 people are estimated to have been killed in the Pacific Northwest heat wave in 2021. And last year's heat wave in Europe killed over 61,000. In the long term, we need to stop and reverse the effects of climate change. In the near term, we're going to need a lot more effective heating and cooling to deal with the extreme temperatures. Let's welcome Bill to dive in. Hi, I'm Bill Key, uh, and I'm a co-founder at Quilt. And I have two kids, uh, James, who's 12, and Ben, who is 10 years old, and I'm based in San Francisco. Well, thanks for naming him uh, after me, your second child. Oh, no, absolutely. That was the plan all along, so you're welcome. What are your kids up to these days? We have the good fortune to have my wife's parents live in Sonoma, up in wine country, just about an hour north of San Francisco. Have they been affected by wildfires up there? Oh, absolutely. Fortunately, their home has been okay. But they've actually had to evacuate a a number of times. Uh, My in-laws actually, they leave for the months of September and October and try to go somewhere else in the the country. Uh, In fact, last year they went to New York. And given what's happened with New York and the smoke this year, it feels a little bit like there's there's just no escape. It's pretty wild that we're at the point of these personal adaptation to wildfire season. It's a very strange, I don't know, that we're like changing our, our... You will schedule to avoid the season of like. Oh, absolutely. Smoke. You look at it through the perspective of, in this case, my in-laws who kind of planned their life around, they're going to retire to wine country and this sort of vision of, of what that can be. And then you have this whole period of the year that is at least the risk of it being uninhabitable is high enough that they have to plan around that. Yeah. And that's just, I think, shocking when, when you actually think about it, what, what that means. It's something. We'll connect the dots both on like the climate side, but also the particular work that you're doing on yeah. heating and cooling spaces touches emissions, but also I think it touches adaptation. I was just reading yesterday, rereading the part of uh, Bill Gates's uh, climate book, uh, going deep on the on the heating and cooling section. And it's just interesting to think about the scale, uh, the global scale. I think there's around a billion, 1.3 billion air conditioners deployed now. And I think j- between now and 2050, it's going to get up to like five or six billion. I mean, there's certain countries like India where the growth is, you know, exponential. It's an adaptation. And I, part of the way that we see it is that uh, it's a necessity. I, I, I think the uh, the number one uh, most deadly natural disaster that can act, that actually occurs regularly are heat waves. The number of people right. that, that die from them is, uh, is pretty dramatic. Is at least an opportunity with people adding more cooling is that they can add the most efficient lowest emissions form of heating paired with that. We want to make sure, you know, for instance, in in parts of the U.S. where people haven't had air conditioning and they're starting to install it now that when they install it, they also get that heat pump uh, that does heating at the same time. So you are kind of able to leverage that new need in order to eliminate the emissions associated with heating. That's exactly, I mean, I'm in Pacific Northwest and a lot of people, I think we're similar to San Francisco. I think it's like 40% air conditioning penetration and, you know, growing. And it's a, it's this moment of, okay, well, if you're going to put it in air conditioning, make it a heat pump, and then you can rip out your gas furnace at the same time, Um, or even heating oil, which we still have a few thousand homes with heating oil. 
Yeah, no, and uh, absolutely. Heating oil. I grew up in the Northeast. I grew up in New England and Massachusetts and the house I grew up in, my dad lives in, still has fuel oil. You know, it gets delivered every winter and doesn't have central air. There's a lot of homes there that don't. But every year, you know, it, April comes around, we get a first warm day or two and the calls start coming in to add cooling. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, one of the most opportune moments to, to be able to introduce heat pumps. New products. What is a heat yeah. pump? Fortunately, there's been, I think, a, a way more discussion of this kind of in uh, in the press over the last year or so. So at its core, a uh, heat pump is uh, an air conditioner that can run both ways. The yep. way that I began to learn about this was understanding the concept that what an air conditioner does is it basically absorbs the heat that's inside your house and, and takes it and ejects it outside your house. And it turns out that you can basically reverse that cycle and absorb heat from outside uh, and bring it inside the house. So that idea of moving heat yep. around, you are literally pumping heat from yes. one place to another. Um, and I think the thing that is very unintuitive is the idea that you can actually uh, pull heat from the outside, even when it's very, very cold. And, and I think that's been one of the central innovations of the last 15 years has been making that work uh, incredibly well. Because even when it's minus 15 degrees, you know, at the level of physics, there's still quite a bit of heat in the air. Correct. Between minus 15 and the temperature of outer space. A hundred percent. Exactly. The yeah. kind of magic of these refrigerants uh, that have been invented that can absorb heat uh, at that low temperature and then bring it inside efficiently enables building heat pumps. That's really the fundamental idea is that you're moving heat around yep. and that's also what makes yeah. it far more efficient. Let's like drill in on that a little bit because I think some people maybe know everything about how their air conditioner or their refrigerator or freezer work. Um, but I think a lot of people are like, yeah, it's somehow... Right. works <laughs> like what you're actually doing let's let's talk you talk about heating because you would think that hey i'm heating you know air and for my house i must be burning some gas or maybe i'm running some electricity through a coil i understand how that gets hot like a light bulb or a toaster oven but what you're actually doing correct me if i'm wrong is it's it's almost like you walked outside on a on a hot sunny day you put out a piece of you know of a black metal right it got hot and then you walked inside and now that heat is inside. And the interesting thing about this is that you didn't expend the energy to heat the metal. You used the ambient temperature outside to actually to actually yeah. heat it. And then you brought it inside and now you have this heat inside. And is that like a fair analogy, kind of just from like a physical, you know? Yeah, kind of yeah, reality? absolutely. I mean, in a sense, right, that you expended some energy to go and pick up that, yes. <laughs> you know, that peak that the heat from outside and bring it in, right? And that's the energy that's being used, you know, to drive the heat pump. Uh, but you didn't have to use the energy to create the heat in the first place, right? And and that's where the savings comes from. And then to do the same in reverse, which is if you can kind of take something inside your house that that kind of yeah. sucks heat out of the out of the room and then walk outside with that, you've kind of you're slowly removing energy from thermal energy that's exactly from your right. house, yeah. thereby cooling it down. Okay. So Obviously, that's not what we're doing. We're not running back and forth. But if you, if you kind of want to understand the magic of it, I think it's good yep. to understand that physical kind of flow. And what we're doing instead is using yep. using refrigerants, uh, which can do this much more efficiently. Uh, just like how do refrigerants, like what's a little bit of on refrigerants and how they work? What you're doing is a refrigerator that's been compressed and turns into a liquid and then allowing it to evaporate and turn into a gas. And when that phase change happens, there's an enormous amount of, uh, of energy transfer. So it turns out that when you're able to take that, you know, that pressure, turn it into a, a liquid and then allow it to evaporate, uh, you, that transfers a tremendous amount of heat into the environment around you. Yes. It's really exploiting that property of, of the, the substance. We're probably most familiar with phase changes in water, right? An ice cube melting actually it cools down the surrounding environment much more significantly than just low temperature water would, right? That phase change releases a bunch of energy or water becoming steam um, or steam condensing back into water. When something is, is say, you know, changing phase from a liquid to a gas, that is, that's effectively boiling, right? That happens at a boiling point. Yes. When, when you hear the word compressor, what you're doing is you're changing the amount of pressure that, is, that you know, is on the, the refrigerant. And it turns out that the boiling point is a function of both temperature and pressure. Uh, and so, you know, by essentially applying pressure, you're changing the boiling point of, of the refrigerant, right? Presum presumably the lower pressure, the lower the boiling That's point, right. right? That's right. 
at sea level, I put water on a pot, it's going to boil at a, at a certain temperature. If I go up into the mountains and boil, it's going to boil at a That's lower right. temperature because there's less pressure kind of holding the water, you know, holding it in the kind of That's water, exactly right. State. Yeah. These are things that, you know, okay. happen all around us all the time, just not in as extreme a yes. way as they happen inside of a heat pump. Yep. Okay. So inside of a heat pump, so if we walk through a cycle, could we walk through like what the refrigerant is doing inside the house and outside the house? Right. Uh, let's take a heating cycle. Okay. So, and, and let's start with the refrigerant is in a gas form and it's coming uh, outside of the house and into the outdoor unit. Okay. Now imagine, take mm-hmm. a situation where you have, you know, humid air on a warm day and you have a glass of ice water, right? What happens to the outside of the glass, right? It, it gets all you know, this condensation, condensation on it, right? That is absorbing some of the heat from the, the surrounding area, right? In order to basically take some of the water that right. is a gas and condense it to a liquid. And so that's what happens when you know, it, the gas comes outside, it's now suddenly exposed in this, this heat exchanger that kind of maximizes the surface area of it uh, to a very cold temperature. And so it starts to condense. And then the compressor comes in and it further pressurizes it, right? As we were saying earlier, and, it, and then it turns into a liquid that's now very, very warm. And it brings it back inside the house, runs it through a heat exchanger, runs air over it and then allows that heat to dissipate into the air. So you've now transferred that, some of that heat that came in through that process of condensation, added to it with the compressor, and then you bring it back inside the house and it brings the heat to the house. And there's two, from my understanding, two main ways that we kind of do that exchange on the outside. One is with, you know, air and the other is underground, right? Yeah. People will call it ground source or geothermal heat pumps as well. Yeah. The idea being that you could transfer energy, and especially in certain climates where perhaps the air yeah. you know, temperatures might not be as forgiving. Okay. One of the things that drives the overall efficiency of the system is the difference in temperature, mm-hmm. right? And if you're pulling heat out of very, very cold air, uh, eventually like the efficiency starts to drop. It's still far more efficient than doing something like a toaster-style resistance right. heating. Uh, you could imagine a circumstance in which uh, you could you know, access essentially more warmth under the ground, and, and that allows you to get a little bit more efficiency out of the system. Those are trade-offs, right? There's expense and complexity associated with installing a, a ground source heat pump, uh, but sometimes that expense and complexity is worth it uh, to drive that additional efficiency. That could depend on if it's a big multifamily building or it's a big commercial building. You know, and in some cases, residences, it, it makes sense to do that too. I think the thing that's remarkable is how much air source heat pumps have actually proven to be uh, viable, you know, even in very cold climates, right? I mean, you have places in Scandinavia, you know, I think Norway's uh, something on, on the order of 80% of all of the new heating systems installed last year were um, were air source heat pumps, right? The fact that those can work in those environments. Yeah, so we've seen this, I mean, for kind of the, the news context, like you've seen this big push, especially across Europe to say, hey, we want to reduce our reliance on gas for heating. So much of our gas is coming through Russian pipelines. Yeah. We're going to shift fully to electric sources, electric heating. Okay, what's the most efficient way to do that? Can you actually do that? You're, yeah. in, you're in this cold climate. You're trying to heat your house. And this idea that you can, again, kind of take heat from outside, even if it's yeah negative 15 outside, is kind of amazing. But the point yeah. is we've gotten so much better with the compressors, with the refrigerants, with just the, the whole cycle to say you actually can, even in these cold climates, achieve taking additional heat energy from outside to heat the inside of a home, you know, up to 70 degrees or whatever you need to do. When people who are homeowners are thinking about what this means for them, I don't think you need to go back and open your high school physics book and and think about all the phase change stuff. I think the thing is to have an intuition of why it is that this is so obviously the technology that works for this, right? Once you intuitively understand this idea of moving heat versus creating it. It's just like there's free energy. There's like, there's free energy outside to go bring into your house. Yeah. Let's just take some of the free energy and bring it inside. Yeah, I've seen that's some positioning do, right? that you can actually even add that, you know, energy that's pulled from the outside and brought inside as like renewable energy. I mean, it, there, in a sense, if you're, tr- if you're trying to do apples to apples comparisons, that, that's like adding more solar or more wind in terms of what it's actually able to deliver in terms of useful energy for people. Conceptually, is it, is, I've seen a ratio is it like one to four, yeah. one to five kind of energy use to kind of the heating you get out the other side? 
for every one watt of electricity that you put into driving the compressor and the fans, you'll get three to five watts of heat energy uh, brought into the house. Okay. Um, and, you know, there that can vary based on the temperatures. It can vary based on the setup of your system or, or things like that. That's where you'll hear people talk about 300 to 500 percent efficiency. Almost seems like uh, illogical, right? Like, how can you have more than 100 percent efficient? But that that's where it comes from. Let's talk then about kind of the ecosystem of products today. For for someone walking around, right? If they look up and they're in, you know, either at their house yep. or at a, you know, say at a hotel or an Airbnb, and they see yep. what's called a mini split unit right, attached to the wall, you're seeing heat pump, air conditioning, and heating in action. I I see a lot of the, you know, a couple large brands like Mitsubishi or Bryant or others traditionally around. What over the last five ten years, like where are we at with the deployment of heat pumps, the quality of the products, and then I, why do we need a new company to come in to come in and exist and tell us about Quilt? I might back up. To, to talk a little bit about how to think about kind of the landscape of, of heat pumps for homes. And there's a whole world of like commercial buildings and stuff too, but, but we'll, we'll keep it scoped to homes. Um, for most people, you're, there's going to be sort of three different types of systems to consider. Um, so one, and this is actually, I would say like pretty common in Europe, um, is what would be called like an air to water system. So it uses that, you know, outdoor unit that we were talking about that harvests the heat from outside but instead of transferring it to air or through one of those indoor units that's on the wall, like you were talking about, um, it transfers it to water that then can run in kind of like a baseboard radiator or, or even like, you know, radiators that, that, that you might see in like a New York apartment or something like that. Um, and that has a lot of benefit to being able to essentially retrofit existing systems where you might have all of that heating uh, that's installed. Uh, that was previously done with a, a fossil fuel power boiler you can now do with a heat pump. Uh, the downside to that type of system is is that it doesn't do cooling. <laughs> you know, back to our earlier point around adaptation, right? So there's that one, there's one class. I think the two that you're more likely to see in the United States, in part because of, you know, the wider deployment and need for cooling, um, are central ducted systems and then ductless systems, right? So if you live in a house where there's grates on the wall that the air comes out of, it's often called a forced air system. You have a, a sort of central, what's called an air handling unit that, you know, if it's set up with a gas furnace, transmits heat to the air uh, through that gas furnace and, and blows it throughout the rest of the home. If you have a central air conditioner, it does that kind of one half of the job that the heat pump does, right? Where it absorbs the heat from the air that's running through the ductwork and pushes it outside. You can essentially replace that gas furnace and central air conditioner with a heat pump that fulfills both of those functions. And for some homes, that, that makes sense. If you have great duct work in your home, it's been relatively recently installed, you might want to just basically replace your central furnace and central air conditioner with that, that heat pump. Um, but for people who either don't have the duct work or, and as it turned out was the case with my home, the duct work is insufficient, uh, which happens a surprising amount of the time. Uh, the primary the alternative um, that we think is actually better overall architecture is what's called ductless. And in that model, rather than having one kind of central heat exchanger that you're pushing the air through and then pushing all throughout the rest of the home, um, you actually essentially put a heat exchanger in every room. That unlocks a number of benefits. Uh, it unlocks the ability to um, control each room individually so that you don't have some parts of your home that end up being overheated and some that are cooler. You end up with benefits uh, like being able to, you know, have your kids have the temperature in one room and that's different in the parents' room. Um, and it's also fundamentally more efficient, far more efficient. So you're not losing energy as the air travels through the ductwork. On paper, like if you were desi to design a system from the ground up, if you think about essentially the platform that a heat pump enables, this kind of distributed system as opposed to the centralized system is just a superior way to do it, both from efficiency and in terms of comfort, right? Similar to the way that like you can take a gasoline car and uh, put in an electric motor and a battery and have an EV, but you're not really taking full advantage of what the platform has to offer, right. you know, where if you design it from the ground up to be electric, you can have more storage, you can have low center gravity and things like that. You know, we believe that, that this ductless model um, it works very well in, in that respect. And so it's really for people who either don't have ducts in their home or as it turned out to be the case for me, the duct work was insufficient. Uh, getting back to what you were saying, right? There are these ductless systems that are on the market. There's Mitsubishi, there's Fujitsu, there's Daikin, uh, there's several others. 
I think our perspective is that in terms of the base functioning of the technology that, that we were discussing earlier, tons of innovation has been driven there, making it work in cold climates, having it be really quiet. I have a Mitsubishi system like that in my house, and there are things that I really love about it. But <laughs> uh, we think that there's a number of dimensions on which it's kind of lacking as a consumer product. Was it a system that I was like excited about getting, this, the way that somebody might be excited about getting a Tesla? There are a number of dimensions that we believe there's an opportunity for, for significant innovation. Um, one is in design, and the, these systems might be common outside the United States, but a lot of people, when they see the unit on the wall, uh, say they stay in an Airbnb and see what they can't imagine having one in their living room or in a bedroom. Uh, there's just the sort of base sort of aesthetics of the device itself. Uh, that's an area that we put a lot of focus and effort from an industrial design standpoint. The other area, and this was something I was frankly shocked to discover with my system, is that there was effectively no software to control it, right? Like I have- no. It's just a remote control yeah. that is controls each unit independently. They don't talk to each other. There's no, there's no, yeah. They're just like their own thermostat. It, exactly. Thing, right? like, I have seven of these units in my home and they don't run as a system. They're not aware of each other. I can even end up in situations where like I have one on heating and then I try to turn another one on on cooling and it just doesn't work. And there's no like error message. There's no communication about what's going on. Like fundamentally the outside unit that's powering all seven is only going to run under one direction, right? So there's one thing which if you wanted kind of simultaneously heat some rooms and cool some rooms, you would need two different outside units, which you could design for. But there are even ways of managing yeah. things like that, you know. Yeah, the experience could be, if you go back to first principles, your goal is to have these different spaces at these different temperatures at these different times, that's what the user should generally interface with more than like controlling a device, right? And, and people have the question about what, like, what should I be doing? Like if a room is unoccupied for six yeah. hours out of the day or something like that, should I just be turning it off? Not necessarily, right? Maybe the power is really cheap. Then maybe you have solar on your roof and you have essentially free power and you know that you're going to want that room cold in three hours and it gets, power is going to get expensive at 7 p.m., you should pre-cool it in some cases, right? There's also just like, some, you can get into a situation where it, if you allow the room to deviate really far from the temperature that you want, the, essentially the startup cost and the energy associated with bringing it back down in the case of cooling can be really high. It turns out this is the type of thing that software and algorithms are really good at solving. You basically want to optimize for when we detect that the room is unoccupied, save the most energy possible knowing that it's going to be occupied again in the future. That, I think, is the area where we see there really has not been a lot of innovation, right? There's been innovation at the level of making the compressors incredibly efficient, incredibly reliable. We're standing on the shoulders of giants when it comes to those things. I think it's fantastic that all of that innovation exists. But I think, as has been the case in a lot of other industries, there's another layer of efficiency and improvement and experience that can be driven by having software that manages these things intelligently in the real world, right? Rather than talking about efficiency as something that takes place in a lab where you're able to measure the output of a compressor, you have a kind of real world use case of people living in a home, using rooms differently, different weather, different times of the year. And, and there's just huge opportunity to optimize all of that. That's great. This hits on a number of threads. One is like, personally, we live in a home where we end up with these wild temperature swings between spaces in our homes, yeah. especially in summertime in Seattle. Like our daughter's corner room just bakes yep. the second half of the day. And our son, who's like in a room right next to her, it, there's like a five degree difference. And we have central cooling and heating. And so I guess we're going to cool down the whole house to cool down this room. And it's, just, it's like, you're yeah, you're chasing that sort of thing. Uh, you're exactly right. I was also thinking as you were talking, are you moving air or are you moving, yeah. you know, this efficient yeah. refrigerant? to where you want to do the actual, like move thermal energy. And it's back to like, wait, you should move this. You have this whole compressor system that's bringing you free energy into your house. And then should you at the entryway, like transfer that to something and then like lose a bunch as you carry leaky buckets around or should you deliver the thermal energy to each room as needed at, in real time as they need for the most optimal outcome. This gets back to this idea of, I think part of the reason why central systems even exist is just kind of, historical accident. You had, uh, I think there, there's both a heating and a cooling side. On the cooling side, you weren't going to, you know, ice in every room in the home. Now, on the heating side, you're not going to put a gas flame in every room in your home. But there's sort of this legacy of these were the systems that were built, right? You have the cent central exchanger because that's the way that the systems 
made sense. And so then you, you, you exchange to, to hot air and then blow the hot air around. Yeah. And even in higher end homes that are being built now, that you get that zoning in every single room, right? You get that personalized control. It's really more the ideal way of setting up a system. Yeah. I think the opportunity here is as people are making this kind of almost like once in a generation platform change, right? Yeah. To go to the best implementation of that platform. Yeah. And it's, it is, it makes sense that you're coming in at this perfect time as well, where uh, the physics is in a pretty good place. But when you think about what innovation is needed, it is on the yeah. consumer experience and the efficiency yeah. and optimization. And that being, it's like, great, let's yeah. go and let's, and let's do that. And so, so yeah, I want to yeah. buy one. Can I buy it? Can I set this up now? We, we got to fix our kids' rooms. Where are we at? You can go to quilt.com and, and sign up for our wait list. Uh, we're, we're running betas through the second half of this year. And then we're going to be doing an announcement in, in 2024 for availability of the product. No, we're really excited to get it out as soon as we can. Uh, I think there are a lot of people who are in that process. The Pacific Northwest is a great example who are thinking about, oh, this is the year or next year is the year we need to install cooling to deal with with the increased temperatures. Uh, that's what we're excited to, to help people with. Yeah. Awesome. And if someone does have central, you know, a central system now, do you see that you're able to come in and then like supplement? There can be different configurations, but at my house, we actually did away with the central system entirely. Oh, wow. So we kind of closed up the duct work and we just have mini splits in the different rooms. Okay. What I would say for most people is, are you like really happy with the way that your duct work functions today? If so, it might be good to go down, you know, the road of of looking at a central system, right? But to your point earlier, if you're struggling with this room is five degrees cooler than that room, that's frankly probably a symptom of duct work that wasn't installed correctly to begin with. And maybe just the last thing that I'll say there is that the way that a heat pump outputs heat is different from a gas furnace. It's actually a lower temperature. It's more constant, but it's a lower temperature. And so that can result in needing to expand the duct work in order to basically be able to handle that. Um, and so that's what you'll often find is people reach this point where what they're facing is, all right, I need to rip open my walls and install or fix a bunch of duct work. That suddenly becomes more invasive and expensive than a ductless system. Where the ductless system, yes, you typically see it kind of run on the outside of the house and then you just pop, that's right. pop it in, which is, so you're not like running it through the middle of the house. Okay. Well, I, I could nerd out on like the installation process and a bunch of things there, but I think we should talk, give people a little lens in, in the last kind of five, 10 minutes yeah. around Great. You're now an authoritative expert on, on heat pumps. Maybe you don't like to, to claim that, but I'll claim it. Uh, you said five years ago, you didn't know what a heat pump was. Like, uh, what were you an expert on five years ago? How did you get here? It was by no means a kind of linear path. I was a product manager at Google for many years. I was there for actually over 15 years. Uh, I did some consumer marketing when I started, and then I was a product manager for uh, the kind of business versions of Gmail and Docs. And then for the longest time, I actually ended up being a product manager on Google Analytics. I kind of loved that product and really got uh, connected to it. Uh, but I did find myself, you know, it was about five years ago, realizing I was in a career in ad tech. And that wasn't what I had imagined for myself. Uh, my kids were, were starting to be old enough where I could see the impact that this was going to have on their lives. Uh, no, I honestly, and I think there's a lot of people in this position, kind of had no idea where to start. I did end up finding a role uh, that was partially, and I think this was kind of an interesting thing for me. It's not like I dove like 100% into climate. Uh, a portion of the job was focused on uh, sustainability efforts for Google's corporate office footprint. Um, and you know, once you start digging into that space, right, and, and the company has made commitments around things like 24 by seven, you know, running the company on 24 by seven renewable energy, it becomes obvious the role back in these buildings plays, right? And so that was where I first got exposed to the idea of a heat pump, uh, that this is something that uh, everybody should be doing. Uh, there, there were kind of a number of steps in between there and, and where I ended up, but probably the biggest one was that I, I went to install a system in my own home, basically because I had learned about this and found it to be, you know, an incredibly frustrating process. I think I talked to about nine different contractors. I got quotes ranging from $10,000 to $75,000. <laughs> I had contractors telling me that categorically that heat pumps don't work. Uh, and I just kind of felt like, wow, as, as a consumer, you know, the idea that this, the pace of this adoption needs to like 10 X <laughs> yeah. in the next 10 years, like the way that these things are working is just not lining up. So I, I actually, I just became super focused on that problem. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. Um, and so I actually ended up, you know, thinking about what position I was in I was at Google. I knew people there. Um, I, I ended up pitching a project that was focused around that purchase journey. So when people are searching for things related to this. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, it was through that, that that I ended up meeting my now co-founder, Paul, uh, one of the incubators I was pitching to. Uh, most people, frankly, were in the position that I was in, you know, maybe five years ago where they're like, what's a heat pump? Right. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but Paul, you know, who had been a successful entrepreneur in the past uh, and had uh, had a startup exit, uh, had worked as a product manager for several years, but was looking to get back into doing a startup um, and had kind of independently identified this space of, of heat pumps. Uh, it, in a sense, had an even more ambitious vision than I did, which was that, you know, it's it's not just about the purchase process. It's about kind of the entire customer experience, right? That's inclusive of the product, that's inclusive of the way that you buy it and, and all of those things. Um, and so originally, I, you know, he and I were just talking. Yep. <laughs> and I was going to angel invest in the company. He asked me in the middle of last year if I'd be interested in joining as a co-founder. Uh, part of me was just like, I couldn't believe that an opportunity like this had come together yeah. in the way that it did. Uh, I joined enthusiastically, and and that's kind of how I, I ended up where I am. Google's a hard place to leave. I talked about this uh, with a, a friend yeah. who's on a couple episodes back. But like that sounds like one of those kind of regret minimization moments. You look back and you're like, wait, am I gonna, am I gonna like, regret giving this a go? And I'm gonna I'm gonna regret not trying Absolutely. at this moment, right? This moment of like climate awareness, yeah. ca- career, you know, development to Google and all these things. Like, how could I not, like, a hundred percent. I mean, part of it, it to me was just like the sheer ambition of it. Where I'll be honest, like initially to Paul, I was like, this is kind of crazy. Like, <laughs> uh, but that, as we dug in, I do think like this idea of uh, being able to redefine the entire customer experience. Uh, I think it, for lack of a better comparison, right? Like t- Tesla, I think has done that for EVs, yes. right? And I think a lot of what you're seeing now, regardless of what you think of Tesla as a company specifically, right? Like yeah. I- They kicked they us kicked, off this transition. It's now like a yep. foregone conclusion, right? And part of it was just, capturing everyone's imagination. We understand cars have a special type of emotional attachment for people. <laughs> yeah, you know, yes. I don't know that heat pumps are, are ever going to have that type of attachment, but it is, it's a product that's visible in your home. Uh, it's something that yeah. one way or another you use every single day. I think these are it's, ripe for f- building fantastic consumer experiences. It's funny. I was thinking, you know, there's, there's multiple great articles written about quilts and some of them are, this is the Nest <laughs> for, and this is the Tesla yeah. for. And I think, I think that actually like kind of speaks to the, you know, somewhere in between, yeah. which is, which is, I do think that, uh, you know, like a car, like this system is the thing that you are daily living with and it is determining your comfort in a pretty fundamental way. And maybe more like a nest in terms of status, like in terms of it's on the inside of your home more than yeah. the outside. Yes. There's a, there's a heat exchanger outside, but a different, a different degree than driving around a kind of American status symbol of a car. I also believe that over the next 10 years, people are going to see these, what I call kind of invisible pieces of infrastructure differently. Like today, most people don't even know the brand that makes their air conditioner or furnace. I think over the next 10 years, they will because, I mean, because everyone's asking them to, to take a look and giving them money to upgrade it. And they're like, oh, should I upgrade my, okay, I guess what do I have? Oh, I have a Bryant AC. Like we're going to start talking about this the same way. I think that's where the Nest comparison does hit. Where I don't think 15 years ago people knew what absolutely not, yeah, brand or cared the model, yeah. and now Nest is a consumer, you know, absolutely. Brand. And I think you've seen similar things in you know the way people consume food, right? Like there's, I think, yes. been a change in attitudes in the last 20 years of like it being somewhat important to understand where your food comes from, right? Not that everybody gets there or that it's 100, percent but I do think it's definitely. A uh, major change in just kind of consumer behavior and attitude, and I, and I think the thing about this space, I think what people are waking up to is just how big a source of emissions it is. I'm a big fan of eliminating emissions everywhere. Coming a vegan is a fantastic way to do that. I read that if you switch from a sort of standard American diet to being a vegan, you save about one ton of carbon emissions a year, which is great. Again, all of the above, right? But you need to make your decision every single day to be a vegan about everything that you put in your mouth, right? With Adopting a heat pump for the average home, you eliminate four tons of emissions. With that one purchase decision, you've locked it in for, say, 15 years, right? Yep. And and, and probably locked it in for the future home. A- absolutely. I mean, afterwards. 15 years is conservative, yep. right? Like, it's probably the entire yes. future of that home. I'm a product manager at heart. If you're stack ranking the features yes. that... What's what's the default? What changes the right, default right. is, the, is the first thing to go after. Yep. This should be the, the thing that's at the top of your list. I think that's the big thing that people are waking up to now. Yeah, that's great. Uh, how's starting a company with, with two young kids? How's being a co Give me a little window into just your year of like these things all sitting together and jumping into work on climate in this way. And just, I don't know, what swirls in your head? I think there's a few things. Like um, one, I would say I have had moments of kind of 
you know, am I qualified to do this? One of the things that I come back to, a big influence on me was also some of the, you know, you mentioned Bill Gates' book. I also read a book called Electrify by Saul Griffith that yep. I, I highly good. recommend. Um, that in some ways, like I think, tipped me over to the edge of of being like, oh my God, like this is this has got to happen. Uh, I think part of it was that realization that we're uh, the the central things that we need to do right now are not inventing technology, but deploying technology. When you think about if you've been a product manager or you've been a software engineer at a big tech company or a startup in the consumer space, things that maybe have nothing to do with with climate, part of what you've been trained to do and get really good at is figuring out how to uh, have servers adopt products, right? And to build products that people are really, really gonna want. Those things end up being transferable. I guess I would just say for people who are out there <laughs> wondering if there's any space for them in this, right? I think if you broaden your perspective to think about option and deployment, at the same time, you know, having humility that there's a lot for you to learn, which I think is another very important thing to enter into this. I think another thing reflecting on it from my side is I think we've been extremely lucky. Uh, we you know, started this conversation in early in the late 2021, early 2022, at that point, like the idea that like the Inflation Reduction Act was going to pass seemed very unlikely. If you searched online for information about heat pumps, you'd come across like misinformation that they don't work in cold climates and all this. That has changed so much in the last year. Uh, I think the policy side has triggered a kind of media cycle that's just been extraordinarily positive. And so I think we just have a tremendous amount of tailwinds. I think investors are seeing that too, right? When we were raising money, this wasn't an area where we were having to go through and explain why heat pumps should even be on your mind, right? Like, Which it, is amazing. It, like back, yeah, back to the, probably the difference that 12 to 18 months makes. I think for folks listening too, like that, like not everything is on the same cycle. Like EVs were there before. And I think heat pumps hit next. I think yeah. stoves are starting to hit too. People are like, oh, maybe I don't want to give my kids asthma. Oh, maybe I need a new stove. But if you kind of look ahead and you're like, wait, is working on climate kind of a a charity act or a very risky place, you have this massive tailwind of just like society is starting to run towards solving the problems. And so that's going to come in the form of subsidies, consumer awareness, investor awareness. Now you're probably trying to hire people and you're not, and people are excited to join. You can take this leap of faith that people are going to want to work to solve this problem over the next decade. And it's not yeah. a hype trend the way that, no. I mean, these are, heat pumps are like, I walk around Seattle, like these are real things cooling and heating people's houses today. This is not, yeah. you know, some new tech we're hoping people might adopt. Yeah. It's like, how do we make the thing better and get it out faster, right? And it and it's solving a kind of base, obvious human need, right? Like, like you know- Not to overheat to death is like yeah, a pretty and, a pretty big one, yeah. Yeah, and, and on the flip side, like having heat in your home, right? Like, I mean, it's, yes. it's hard to imagine a more basic, you know, role that shelter plays, right? right. Uh, and so- these are these are not you know needs that we need to invent uh, for consumers, Correct. right? Uh, uh, and and so no, I mean that gives me confidence, right? That this is this is certainly a you know a long lived uh, category. Awesome. Well, if folks want to. It sounds like you have a wait list, so if you're if you're yes. excited about the product, that's absolutely that's one call to action. But otherwise, what would you recommend people kind of if they want to follow along your journey uh, and or other books? It sounds like Electrify was pretty foundational for you. Um, yeah. Are there others that you'd call out? You know, or yeah. I, I mean, know? Electrify w was absolutely fantastic. I think you know, I, I would also echo the the book by Bill Gates, and there's another one by John Doerr that I think you know lay out a lot of the path ahead. I think for people like getting an idea of what the situation in your house is, right? There are a lot of people that don't even know what the system in their house is, whether it's gas, yeah. whether it's. I mean, it's. It, it sounds maybe crazy after this conversation, but I wasn't too far away from that a number of years ago. You don't need a ton of expertise, like to just kind of get a sense of, oh, okay, we have a gas furnace that was installed five years ago, but maybe I should make a plan for time in the next five years, or actually it's 12 years old and I need to be making a plan for next year. I think maybe the one thing I would say there is the worst situation that people end up in is where it just breaks and yes. it's winter and it's cold. Then, you d then you're going to have a hard time like making this somewhat more considered thoughtful decision, right? So the more like planners <laughs> we can get out there, the, the better. So I would just say have an idea of what your situation is, especially given that it probably represents you know, the first or second largest source of your personal emissions, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you'll be set up, you'll be 80% better set up than most people are. I think everyone's turning to, to their partners and be like, hey, maybe our next car should be an EV. Just right. add to that, make me our next car should be an EV and we should look at at swapping over to a heat pump. That's exactly. a, a great call to action to end on. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Bill. This was a fantastic conversation. I'm glad we, we got into all of it.
Yeah, thanks, Ben. No, this has been super exciting, and I'm a proud climate papa as well. So, uh, um, yeah, really excited. Turns to, out there's to more a than a dozen of us. There's a lot of us that want uh, want this to be a habitable planet for our kids and maybe future grandkids. Absolutely, absolutely. Why do you think they decided to call the company Quilt? Because the Earth is covered with a quilt. Well, that's episode 10 of Climate Papa. For regular listeners, I apologize for the gap since episode 9. I am generally targeting to release a new episode every week or so, but we ended up taking a family trip this month, and I'm just working to catch up now. Coming up, we have some phenomenal conversations, including the next episode, which is about another appliance topic. We're going to talk about gas versus induction stoves. To not miss an episode, make sure to subscribe or follow wherever you listen to podcasts. And please send me a note anytime to ben at climatepapa.com. I love hearing from listeners about what they thought about the episode, getting guest suggestions, or just little notes about uh, whatever's on your mind. And with that, our music is the Balkan Bump remix of Mellow Kind of Hype by Slink and Lazy Syrup Orchestra. Let's have them take us out. On we go like...